This podcast is brought to you by the listeners of the Irish History Podcast who have become patrons. Listeners who become patrons get lots of extra bonus features such as early access, exclusive patrons podcasts, access to episode guides and much more. Become a patron today and support your history at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Irish podcast. Listeners who become patrons also get a shout out. And today I want to dedicate this show to Jonathan Stakem, Daniel Laurel, Joseph Cannon, Desiree Holton, Connor Keneally, Wendy Edwards, Neil Walker, Killian Fee and Kevin Mannion. Thanks for your ongoing support, folks. It really means a lot. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is Free Trade or Famine. In the last podcast in the Great Famine series, we saw how the potato crop had failed in late 1845 and Ireland faced disaster. This episode takes us through the winter of 1845 through to April 1846 as the situation deteriorated. Food riots, protests and threats against those with food became common. Meanwhile, at the centre of power, the famine crisis facing Ireland is consumed by bitter political disputes in London. In this podcast, we follow the fate of millions, increasingly uncertain where they will find food from. But, as is so often the case in the show, we begin in a quiet, secluded spot in the west of Ireland, this time in County Leitrim. The Duff River in County Leitrim is little known today save for fishermen who are drawn to its waters to fish its salmon stocks. More of you might know the wider region from a well-known mountain, Ben Bulbin, which is located only a few kilometres to the south. This part of Ireland is old, with a story that stretches back beyond the bounds of history into Irish mythology. The mountain, Ben Bulbin, is supposedly the burial place of Ireland's most famous mythological lovers, Diarmid and Gráinne while the River Duff itself formed the border between the medieval kingdoms of Connacht and Ulster. Unsurprisingly, the surrounding countryside has seen its fair share of battles. On December 12, 1845, a now forgotten chapter entered both local lore and history when fifty local men gathered near the River Duff in winter darkness. Some were armed. According to a subsequent police report, it was around four in the morning when they made their way along the river to where a few of the local landowners' gamekeepers were keeping watch for would-be poachers. What followed hardly constituted a pitched battle, and the fifty men easily drove away the outnumbered gamekeepers. The fifty or so poachers then proceeded to fish the river before firing six shots into the air and retiring in jubilation, screaming and shouting through the darkness. The incident was only recorded in police reports and seems to have dropped below the radar of contemporary newspapers. While it lacked the enduring nature of the story of Diarmid and Gráinne, it did however hint that Ireland stood on the threshold of a major upheaval provoked by starvation. Poaching was always common enough, but poaching on this scale was unusual. Leitrim had been unsettled before the failure of the potato crop back in September and October 1845, but there is no question that poaching on such a grand scale could not have on some level been motivated by the increasing concerns most in Ireland now had about where their food was going to come from in the coming months, given that a large amount of the potato crop had been attacked by blight. Indeed, for those families who had seen their potato harvest decimated, the returning poachers were a welcome sight. Fresh salmon, if not sold, provided a much welcome meal. While events like this in December 1845 were still isolated outliers, there was little doubt about the gathering storm that was about to break over Ireland. However, that said, wholesale panic had still not yet gripped the population that Christmas. The very poor were beginning to feel what we might call the pinch, but the desperation was still being held at bay. The best indication of this could be seen in the 130 workhouses across Ireland. Built by the British government under the 1838 Poor Law, they gave relief to the destitute poor. Those with no other option could find food in these bleak institutions. While they were detested, they nevertheless represented a last port of call 
and were a litmus test of the wider desperation in society. In December 1845, there were only just over 38,000 people in Irish workhouses, far short of their total capacity of over 100,000. It was clear most were not yet starving. Many who had lost part of their potato crop were still eating what had not yet rotted. They were in a bleak race against time, trying to eat what potatoes they had left before the mysterious blight spread and destroyed what food remained. However, as Christmas gave way to the new year of 1846, the signs of widespread desperation began to appear. Stories proliferated that the poor were now being reduced to eating already diseased potatoes. This was dangerous, and those who tried to eat the putrid crop were extremely sick. One source described the symptoms as bowel complaints along with painful and violent griping, which lasted for eight to twelve hours. On February the 13th, 1846, a doctor named J.P. Evans from County Clare reported from the town of Newmarket on Fergus that a large proportion of the poor are attacked with colic, purging and vomiting after eating bad potatoes. The entire population of the village is living on unsound potatoes. Indeed, a government medical report compiled in early 1846 illustrated that this was becoming a pretty widespread practice. However, still, while desperation was beginning to spread, few, if any, were at risk of actually starving to death yet. But there was no mistaking that the future was increasingly dire. The poor and politicians alike were increasingly worried about what lay ahead now. Daniel O'Connell, Ireland's most well-known political figure, had voiced his concerns in a letter to his fellow Member of Parliament, William Smith O'Brien, on December the 23rd, 1845. What doubts O'Connell had had about what was coming down the road were being replaced by pessimistic certainty that famine was inevitable. He stated, My attendance on the Mansion House Relief Committee has made me acquainted with the frightful certainty of an approaching famine. You know pestilence always follows famine. The prospect is really frightful, especially in the north of Ireland. If the government does not act promptly, it is impossible to calculate the numbers of people that will perish in Ireland within the next 12 months. However, in December 1845, Daniel O'Connell cannot have been hopeful that the British authorities would act promptly. As a member of that Mansion House Relief Committee, he had asked the British government to take several measures. These included a ban on the distillation of grain, a closure of Irish ports to export of food and to open Irish port to international trade. These had all been rejected. While Prime Minister Robert Peel launched secret relief measures, which I will return to later in the show, his public attempts to tackle the issue of exports and imports had been nothing short of disastrous and certainly did not inspire confidence. In late 1845, while the situation in Ireland began to deteriorate, instead of closing ports, Robert Peel, the Prime Minister, had tried to repeal the Corn Laws. This backfired pretty spectacularly from an Irish perspective. But to understand why the Prime Minister would try to repeal these taxes, known as the Corn Laws, we need to look at politics in England and ideas that would exert life and death influence over Ireland in the coming years. In December 1845, there was scarcely anywhere more removed from the crisis unfolding in Ireland than the monthly meetings of the Political Economy Club that convened in the Freemasons Tavern, Great Queen Street in London. As an anxious Christmas approached many back in Ireland, the members of this club, set up to promote free trade, lived in a world apart, having paid their annual membership fee of five guineas, enough to keep a poor Irish peasant in food for months, they gathered on the evening of December the 4th for their monthly talk. On this occasion, the speaker was William Coulson, a renowned surgeon who spoke on the topic of Is the law of primogeniture favourable to the accumulation of wealth? For most people, this was stultifyingly boring stuff. And for the starving poor in Ireland, the accumulation of wealth was hardly a concern. Survival was their priority in the coming months. They were a world apart from the meetings of this political economy club. Or so it seemed. However, appearances can be deceptive 
and the starving poor in Ireland were not as removed from this club as you might think. The often abstract and obtuse titles of the club's talks obscured the fact that its members were among one of the most influential groups of people you could find in Victorian Britain or Ireland for that matter. The individual membership boasted some of the most influential economists and politicians of the day. Along with numerous MPs, some of the 19th century's most famous economists, John Stuart Mill, William Nassau Sr. and David Ricardo had all been members at one time or another. Their goal was to advance the cause of free trade unfettered by government interference or taxes and in late 1845 the situation in Ireland became immensely important for these free marketeers. While they were increasingly successful in having trade tariffs and taxes removed in Britain, the wider free trade lobby had run up against a major obstacle, the Corn Laws. These laws, which taxed the imports of corn into the United Kingdom, which included Ireland, more or less stopped the free trade in grain. And strange as it may sound, the Corn Laws actually got people pretty fired up in the 1840s. They were a lot like the issue of healthcare in US politics today. Everyone had an opinion and they were few in the middle ground. So in late 1845, when Ireland and its looming famine became entangled in this debate around whether the Corn Laws should be repealed or not, this proved a very dangerous place to be. It had all started when Robert Peel, the Prime Minister, had received demands for the closure of Irish ports. Lord Hewtesbury, the Lord Lieutenant, who we have met in previous shows, had actually recommended this as a temporary measure, but Peel replied that this would have given Ireland preferential treatment over other parts of the United Kingdom, something he, and the free trade lobby for that matter, could not countenance. Although leader of the Conservative Party, an organisation which traditionally were in favour of the Corn Laws, Robert Peel had been converted to the cause of free trade and he now saw an opportunity in Ireland's difficulty. As the food crisis unfolded, he argued that this was a reason to repeal the Corn Laws. At the time, he said this was the best way to alleviate the situation in Ireland, claiming the removal to the impediments to trade is the only effectual remedy. However, while Peel had taken other genuine relief measures, which we'll come to later on, it seems he saw Ireland in this case as a useful argument in terms of the Corn Laws, rather than believing it would genuinely help the situation. Now, whatever his exact motivations were, and we'll never know because at the time he did say contradictory things, we do know that this backfired spectacularly from an Irish perspective, when the whole issue exploded into a major controversy. Indeed, by the time the Political Economy Club were meeting on December the 4th, 1845, it was reaching its zenith. Robert Peel had faced a monumental challenge from the outset when he attempted to repeal the Corn Laws. He was in an odd position where his opponents, the Liberal Party, would probably back him, but large numbers of his own Conservative Party would regard him as a traitor for abandoning their protectionist principles. As late as 1844, they had voted 308 to 1 to keep the Corn Laws and now Robert Peel wanted them to do exactly the opposite. Now despite these odds Peel went ahead and began to sound out support within his own cabinet using the looming famine in Ireland as an excuse to repeal the Corn Laws. This triggered an extremely polarising debate putting the issue of famine relief on the side of those who favoured repealing the Corn Laws. It was inevitable then that people began to form opinions about what was happening in Ireland based on their actual opinions of the Corn Laws. Those in favour of keeping the laws began to minimise the very existence of a crisis in Ireland because it was being used as a reason to repeal them. It was on this basis that a Conservative mayor of Liverpool flatly refused to hold a meeting to organise famine relief for Ireland, Isaac Butt an up-and-coming Irish politician at the time, wrote that raising the issue of starvation in England at this time was stigmatised as deluding the public with false alarm, but went on to note that men's politics determined their beliefs about the situation. Meanwhile, the anti-Corn Law faction, voiced by things like, say, The Economist magazine, were quite happy to report on the Irish crisis in strong terms. But the reality was that what was happening in Ireland was less important to either side than their views on the Corn Laws. With battle lines drawn, Robert Peel did go to war with his political opponents over this issue, 
bringing with him the fate of millions of poor Irish people who had no idea they were being flung around the British political arena. From the get-go, Peel was clearly in trouble. When he raised the issue in his own cabinet, his Conservative Party members would not move on the issue and two resigned in protest, weakening his position. Then, the leader of the opposition, Lord John Russell, dropped a bomb into the entire affair when he said he was in favour of total abolition of the Corn Laws. This turned the political climate up to boiling point and on December the 6th, 1845, Robert Peel threw in the towel and resigned as Prime Minister. It has been speculated that he did this to hold the fractured Conservative Party together. Whether a stroke of genius or luck, it did pay off. The opposition Liberal Party was not yet in a position to form a government and Peel was back in power in a matter of weeks. However, amidst all this politicking, huge damage had been done from the perspective of the people in need, those facing famine in Ireland. A hardened faction in British politics now emerged who denied the very existence of a crisis in Ireland. George Bentinck, a staunch Conservative MP, voiced his opinion bluntly. The potato famine in Ireland was a gross delusion. While the debate around the Corn Laws was far from over, it's hard to see that Robert Peel genuinely thought Ireland would benefit, but was more happy to use it as a strong moral case in 1845. One way or another, the entire debacle had been a disaster. But back in Ireland, things began to go from bad to worse as spring approached in the new year of 1846. But before we look at that, I want to take a quick break. While politicians in England were debating the pros and cons of repeating the Corn Laws, Christmas had come and gone and the new year of 1846 had opened in Ireland with apprehension. The blight began to fade, but then in wet weather in January it seemed resurgent. Overall the situation seemed complex and unclear. If I had to use an analogy, perhaps to say it was a bright cloud with a very dark lining explains the situation best. The bright cloud was the fact that the early predictions of the scientific commission that Robert Peel had sent to Ireland in October 1845 proved to be a huge exaggeration. They had predicted that around 80% of the crop would be lost. However, in the end, somewhere in the region of 30% of potatoes in Ireland were destroyed by the blight. This was a serious enough blow, but it was softened by two key factors. Firstly, the overall potato crop planted in 1845 had been larger than normal and the oat crop, which many poor tenants used to pay their rent, had been better than usual. The latter staved off tens of thousands of people falling into arrears and obviously facing the threat of eviction because of it. In early 1846, some reports seemed to indicate that the economy was continuing to function okay and that the impact of the blight was minimal. Between October 10th, 1845 and January 5th, 1846, over 32,000 cattle, 32,000 sheep and 100,000 pigs had been exported from Ireland to Britain. However, these headline figures hid a growing crisis on the ground in Ireland. The country faced a major crisis, albeit not as bad as the one initially predicted in late 1845. Even the loss of 30% of the potato crop pushed many into dire straits. At a meeting in County Clare in February 1846, a priest from Kilmurray, Father Edward Barry, broke down in tears when he had to describe the distress and wretchedness he had for the last month witnessed. There was little government relief available yet and the reaction amongst landlords varied massively. Some took pity and farmers in Meath, for example, who sublet patches of land to poor farm labourers, remitted the rent. However, elsewhere the poor were being shown no sympathy, which led to growing tensions. As early as January, a major standoff developed at Knox Entry near Castle Connell, County Limerick, when a local landlord, Capel Mullineau, attempted to evict tenants on his lands who had fallen behind in their rents. His bailiffs, however, were met with an armed crowd of 1,500 people. A few shots fired into the air frightened off the bailiffs. However, when a force of over 200 soldiers and police arrived on the scene, this successfully broke up the resistance. Incidents like this were still relatively isolated in the early months of 1846, but they were at the same time indications that there was a growing crisis, which may not have been as bad as originally thought, But nonetheless, things were getting desperate for some at least. 
With the next harvest a full nine months away, it was clear major intervention would be needed in Ireland. While the debate on the Corn Laws had delivered nothing for Ireland, and in fact only served to harden attitudes around the idea that there was no problem at all, Robert Peel, to his credit, had taken secret relief measures and ones that were far more proactive than any other Prime Minister did. As we saw in the last episode, in late 1845 he had put in motion a plan that saw £100,000 worth of maize imported to Ireland from the USA. This had to be done in secret as it was feared that if plans emerged it would push prices up. While the situation in Ireland grew more desperate, an agent of the Bearings Bank, Thomas Ward, was furiously buying up maize in the USA in secret. The first shipments had left before Christmas 1845 and arrived in the port of Cork on February 10th 1846. While this was unquestionably a step in the right direction after the debacle of the Corn Laws, before anyone gets too excited about the gesture, it too soon was bogged down in the free market principles that had dominated the Corn Law debates. While importing vast volumes of food was one thing, distributing it was another matter entirely. In total, it eventually amounted to about 20 million kilos of maize, which had to be broken down into millions of individual food parcels. Therefore, some form of administration was needed to do this. Robert Peel, still firmly believing that he was facing a temporary seasonal food crisis in Ireland, established a temporary relief committee to coordinate this and other relief efforts. By the time the first food ships began to arrive in Cork Harbour, this commission, led by Randolph Routh of the British Army Supply Department, were already busy overseeing the construction of a network of food depots to store the maize. This all seemed pretty straightforward and heading in the right direction. However, when the precise plans for how this food was going to be distributed were unveiled, we get the first hint of how the British government planned to deal with Ireland on a more long-term basis. The free market principles that had dominated the debates around the Corn Law were going to be central, and this would be very problematic, as we will see. Basically, no matter what happened in Ireland, the British government were adamant that a normal market in food had to continue to operate, even if this meant exporting food from Ireland. In this vein, the government decided that they would only supply food not already on the Irish market. This was one of the reasons why they sourced maize from the USA. Maize would prove to be a far from ideal food, as we shall see in future episodes. But, that aside, there were far bigger problems with the underlying principles of how this scheme would work. Because they decided that the market had to operate, no food was going to be given out for free as it was argued that this would simply undercut the wider price of food. With these ideas in mind, local voluntary committees were established across Ireland to organise the distribution, or I suppose what might be a more accurate term, the sale of the maize that which was being imported. These committees had to first fundraise money in what was going to be a bizarre system to pay the government for the imported maize. Now the British authorities pledged to match whatever the local committees fundraised with an equal amount and this would then be used to buy the imported maize. The committees then would oversee the sale of the maize at cost price to the starving poor. If this all seems really complicated, it's because it is and you don't really need to understand the specific details. In terms of the poor, if they couldn't afford to actually buy this food, they were going to be made work on public schemes and it was only if someone was on the verge of starvation that they would be given the food for free. The elaborate system was established basically to ensure the government was not or at least not seen to be involved in the trade of food or interfering in the market. That this was a deeply flawed system goes without saying. The poorest areas which were most likely to need the most support were obviously going to be able to fundraise the least amount of money and therefore would be able to buy the least amount of maize. This whole scheme was fuelled by this commitment to the free market, but also underscored by a belief that ultimately the British government was not responsible, even though Ireland was part of the United Kingdom. Charles Trevelyan, the British Under Secretary of the Treasury, who exerted huge influence, an influence that would only grow over time, stated at this juncture, the landlords and other ratepayers are the parties who are both legally and morally answerable for affording due relief to the destitute poor. Similar views were widely held amongst many in the British ruling class. Essentially, 
Irish landlords should be made to shoulder the responsibility and accept the burden, whether or not they could afford it. With this apparatus set up, the government now placed one final stipulation, that they would not release the supplies of maize in the depots until the last possible moment. They believed that the Irish poor were ultimately idlers at heart and would take relief once it was made available. Therefore, May the 15th, 1846, was set as the date when the food depots were due to open. However, long before this, it became clear that this date was not just optimistic, but unrealistic. Relief was going to be needed much sooner. There was simply no way Ireland was going to survive that long. On March the 30th, the depots in Cork, Clonmel and Longford had to be opened. However, the food being released through these depots was still minimal, and indeed most of the maize was still in transit from the USA. Meanwhile, the situation on the ground in Ireland was deteriorating rapidly. While the government had set the date of May the 15th, 1846, for their major intervention, the situation was reaching breaking point long before this. Even though the crop failure had not been half as bad as it was initially thought, by the end of March, food was starting to run out in many communities. A report compiled on April the 4th, 1846, presented a picture of a society already in turmoil. This report was based on correspondence from several parishes across nearly all counties except the North East. In the North West, Cavan and Donegal were among the most hopeful regions, with reports predicting the current stock of potatoes lasting until May. However, in Monaghan, the situation was already at breaking point. Hundreds of families were said to have run out of food. In South Connacht, the crisis was even more serious and in Galway, famine had already set in. The report from Clan Rush near Loch Ray reported, There are 200 families without a morsel of food. Whole families are lying prostrate on straw without covering medical aid or nourishment. In parts of Munster, a similar situation prevailed. Cora Finn in County Clare was reported to be on the verge of famine and so it continued. Reports either predicted famine in a matter of weeks or months or communities already suffering from it. An underlying theme to the entire report received on April the 4th was also the threat of violence. It was increasingly feared that if relief was not made available, people would forcibly take what food they could. For example, in Bally Longford in County Kerry, a group of 50 labourers turned up to the house of the local parish priest, Reverend McCarthy, and informed him if relief was not forthcoming, they would steal some of his cows. Similar stories were reported across the country. Randolph Routh argued that more relief was needed, but Charles Trevelyan in the Treasury in London insisted that the original plan of minimal government intervention would work and would not change. However, it was obvious soon this simply wasn't the case. The workhouses were beginning to fill up even though they were so despised one report stated some people were prepared to die rather than enter them. The island was now starting to convulse with fear, desperation and hunger. However, as early as December 1845, the MP William Smith O'Brien had warned the British government that Ireland would not lie down and die of starvation and by April these words seemed prophetic. As he predicted, the tensions, which we saw through incidents at the start of the show like the poaching in Leitrim, now broke out into major food riots centred around South Tipperary. This was rich farmland with a network of prosperous market towns, but also a large numbers of starving people. Despite this starvation, the large wealthy farmers of the region, whose crops of wheat and oats had not been affected, proceeded to prepare these crops for export. This was more than the poor could tolerate. In Tipperary Town on Monday, April the 13th, 1846, a large cart of flour was attacked by a crowd of starving people who then drove back the police when they tried to intervene. While the army eventually did restore order, much of the flour was taken, but this was just the beginning. A far more serious situation developed in Clonmel, a large market town and river port about 30 miles from Tipperary Town. The people in the countryside surrounding the town were truly desperate and when the government rejected calls to release more aid, this pushed them over the edge. When local merchants prepared a vast convoy of over 100 carts of flour for export on Thursday the 9th of April, huge numbers of people mobilised to stop the food leaving 
Four days later, on the same day as the upheaval in Tipperary Town, another shipment was being prepared in the surrounding countryside and again huge numbers of people gathered outside Clamel from one in the morning. However, to guarantee that the market and food continued to function and the exports also continued, a large military escort was provided to guard the flour and despite numbering in the thousands, the starving people could do little to intervene. However outraged, they did storm several mills around Clonmel, carrying away flour. The following morning, the poor then began to raid bread shops in the town, and the situation deteriorated rapidly. Eventually, the army did restore order, but the riots had the desired effect, as the wealthy in Clonmel came forward with £500 to employ the poor immediately. For the time being at least, the poor would have work and be able to buy food. However, on April the 21st, serious rioting then broke out in Carrigan-Shore, another river port in the region. Around this time, appeals were again made to the British government to step in, to close Irish ports and buy up grain due for export in order to keep it in the country. But this was anathema to their iron commitment to free trade and was rejected. Ireland limped along into May when the government was due to make their major intervention. However, already it was increasingly obvious what maize they had imported was going to fall far short. The government reserves could feed around 1 million people for 40 days. However, reports on the ground estimated that as many as 4 million people now would need food in May, June and July. Something would have to give. While Ireland was on a knife edge as the summer of 1846 approached, there was also another looming issue on the horizon. One few wanted the continents. What if the blight returned? While there were many theories, no one still had any real idea how the disease functioned. If it struck in 1845, why couldn't it destroy the harvest of 1846? The answers are ahead of us in coming shows. Until then, Sloan. And don't forget, you can become a patron of this series on the Great Famine today at patreon.com forward slash irish podcast. 